Almost every retrofit consists of converting walls into shear walls. So a cripple wall that supports the floor, we need to retrofit that and turn it into a shear wall. Other walls that support a floor above, such as in the garage, even in the living room, that supports a floor that you don't want to have you know, fall off its foundation. All those walls are converted into shear walls. And here we're going to learn how to build shear walls. So we're going to go over framing. We're going to go over the way they should be nailed. We're going to go over how uh, their different types of hardware are used to make sure that they are preserved and they're not damaged. We're going to go over the old uh, uh, cripple wall bracing or the old shear wall conversion uh, process using diagonal sheathing. We're going to take a look at that. The, not very many people talk about that or even know about that. And it's really important to know you can, you can save a lot of money with that knowledge. We're going to go over all those things. And I think by the time this is done, you're going to know practically everything there is uh, to know about building a shear wall from framing to uh, nailing the plywood, practically everything. So anyway, uh, take a close look and you may have to hit your pause button every once in a while to study it but I think you're really going to enjoy this. So this wall represents a wall that we've converted into a shear wall. This red right here, that represents one piece of plywood. This represents another piece of plywood. And this right here is a really critical part. This is called edge nailing. So all along the edge of the uh, shear wall, and right here it's just not that you don't see the nails, but um, that's just because when the drawing was done, a mistake was made. But there would also be nails here. So the edge nailing is all the edges of the plywood. And it means each piece of plywood. So if you look right here, the edge of this plywood, you see how the nails are right there. And then on this uh, piece of plywood, the exact same thing. You'll see how all the nails are right here. This is the really critical thing. That's This is what makes a, uh, determines the strength of a shear wall. So always be really careful about that. Now this right here, these are also nails. This is called in the field which means it's not on the edges. Now these nails uh, don't need to be any closer than 12 inches apart. A lot of people putting them in closer than that, you know, they think somehow they get some benefit. Uh, there's no reason to waste your nails and do more than that. Next thing I want to point out is where they come together. Okay, you should also have nails that join these two together like that. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. So here you can hit the pause button and take a look at this uh, sample shear wall and also read about its construction. And it might be a good idea to take a little time here because later on we'll be talking about the same things and it'll give you some background. So this table is from the building code and it tells us how much earthquake force a shear wall can resist depending on how it's nailed. So remember a minute ago I was talking about how the nailing determines the strength of a shear wall. Uh, that is you know, reflected in this table from Research Report 154. And that's published by the American Plywood Association and it's a result of their research laboratories that, you know, the research that they did on shear walls. Anyway, this is how the whole thing works. So this table is from the building code and it lets us know how strong shear walls are depending on how they're built and especially how they're nailed. Probably the most important consideration is the nail spacing at panel edges. That means uh, all along the edge, the outside edge of the plywood, how far apart are the nails? So here, if the nails are six inches apart on the edges, four inches apart on the edges, three inches apart on the edges, and two inches apart on the edges, and you see all these values right here, that represents the number of pounds of earthquake force that they can resist. Now remember, earthquake uh, resistance is measured in pounds. The force that's attacking a house is also measured in pounds. So if we have 10,000 pounds of force attacking a house, we need to have 10,000 pounds of resistance, and that is given by so many feet of plywood. So if we're having 10,000 pounds uh, attacking, we need 10,000 pounds of resistance, also rated in pounds. And these numbers right here tell us uh, how many pounds of resistance the plywood has if it's nailed in a certain way. So let's look at this one right here. This is using a 1532nd. Uh, plywood that's also known as half inch plywood. I like to point out you don't get any more strength if you go beyond that, a five eighths, three quarters, you know, inch and eight doesn't matter. Uh, once you get beyond this, 
uh, the failure is no longer in the plywood, it is in the nails, so we don't worry about it at that point. Now if we use a 10 penny nail, and that's just a type of nail, so it's, it's, it's actually 148 uh, thousandths of an inch, and uh, in this case we use uh, two and a half inches long, or two and a quarter inches long actually, and when we nail uh, two inches on center, or two inches apart, is, you know, on center means the same thing, we end up with a shear wall that can resist 870 pounds per linear foot. And what that means is if there was 870 pounds of earthquake force that were pushing against the shear wall, once that force eat, reached 870 pounds, the shear wall would fail. So um, that's something we need to keep into consideration. So let's take a, a look at another one. Let's say the uh, plywood is nailed three inches apart, but we're using a smaller eight, ten, uh, eight penny nail. And we come down here and we get this uh, number right here, 550 pounds, exact same thing. That means that this plywood, if it's nailed this way, it can resist 550 pounds of earthquake force. Now I'd like to point out that the grade of plywood that we use in shear walls is structural one. That's a special type of grade that's made for shear walls. And this right here tells us how far into the plywood uh, into the framing, into the 2x4s behind the plywood, the nails have to go. So this pretty much uh, is you know, the, what we need to know whenever we're designing a retrofit. I'd like to point out that you kind of wonder, well, which one should you use? Should you do three inches on center uh, with eight penny nails and get 550 pounds per linear foot? Should you use two inches on center and uh, get 870 pounds per linear foot. Now there's two ways to design a retrofit. You can say, you can calculate it and say, okay, I'm gonna have to resist a 5,500 pounds, which would mean you're gonna need 10 linear feet. Uh, that's uh, 550 pounds per linear foot. Or you can say, you know what? I'm not really sure how big that earthquake's gonna be. I'm just gonna go ahead and make it as strong as I possibly can, and I'm gonna nail mine at two inches on center, and I'm gonna get 870 pounds per linear foot. I hope that made sense to you, but my personal philosophy is you just make them as strong as you can, and if the earthquake isn't quite that strong, well, you know, that's fine. It still would have worked it worked out. If it's, you know, stronger than my calculations told me, then, you know, it's really nice to have that safety uh, margin in there. And next thing I'd like to point out, this is very, very critical, is underneath this chart, you're going to see um, footnotes. Now, this, uh, this is not a complete set of footnotes. This is just one of the footnotes I'm explaining. And this says framing at adjoining panel edges shall be three inches on center, three inches nominal or wider, and nails shall be staggered where nails are spaced two inches on center. So that means when they're two inches on center, which is what we have right here, we see this footnote. And this tells us that wherever uh, two pieces of plywood join together, the piece of plywood needs to, I mean, the framing behind it needs to be three inches wide. And they do that so that when you put the nails in, you know, you can, you can get, a, you know, a lot of meat on the wood. But the code has changed and now you're allowed to use two two by fours so long as they're nailed together properly. We mentioned that previously and we're going to explore that in some detail shortly. Now we're going to take a look and see how that information on that table has been applied to retrofit guidelines. There are quite a few retrofit guidelines. We're going to look at a few of them. And the first one that was ever written was Appendix Chapter A3 of the California Existing Building Code. That came out in, I guess, around 1960 or so, quite some time ago. And I happen to know the engineer who put those together, and he's actually since died of old age about 10 years ago. But um, this is what they, they decided to do. They took those, uh, that table and very rationally they said, okay, the nails need to go on the edges. And so what they did is they put, here's the edge of the plywood. This is the plywood right here. And along all the edges, they put the nails. So that's pretty simple. A yeah, pretty much direct application of the information on that table. And this is how Appendix Chapter A3 does it. And we'll look at some of the other ones right now. So here's a table in the building code that tells us the exact same thing. Here it states that wood structural panels, that means plywood, shall overlap the top members of the double top plate. That means it covers the, you know, the top plate at the top. 
in the bottom plate by inch and a half. So that means it's you know got to cover that wood, uh, the, the framing by inch and a half. And a single row of fasteners shall be placed three quarters of an inch from the panel edge. Now that means you take you take your plywood, which has been extended all the way up the shear wall, touches the joist, and you go down three quarters of an inch, and then you nail your uh, nails. Uh, and you know, most, usually we stagger them a little bit. We don't want anything to split. But they want the nails right in the center of that two by four, which is an inch and a half wide. So again, the building code is saying that we should put our nails on the outer edges of the piece of plywood. Now, for some reason, the standard plan A, which is a regional guideline for the San Francisco Bay Area, for some reason they de decided to change things. So rather than putting the nails on the uh, outer edges of the plywood on all four sides, they decided at the top they would stagger them. And there's absolutely no reason to do that. There's no testing that showed that's necessary. And if you think about it, uh, just for a little bit, you'll see why it's not a particularly good idea. So here we have the, you know, here's a nail here. It goes down to this lower top plate, which is here. Upper top plate, another nail, another nail, another nail. Remember, this is the upper top plate and the lower top plate. Now, the reason this is a problem, this is a framing anchor. So what that does is that connects the floor, and the floor is what we're worried about rocking back and forth, to the upper top plate. And so what happens is as this moves, the earthquake force goes this way, and then these nails, which are inch and a half long, go an inch and a half into this. So what they do is they push on the upper top plate. They don't push on the lower top plate. They only push on the upper top plate. Therefore, only the nails that are also into the upper top plate are actually transferring force down into the bolt. So this is a very serious oversight. So let's say this shear wall was, you know, nailed. In fact, these are nailed four inches on center. I think they're around 300, you know, around 400 pounds per linear foot but only half the nails are actually doing anything. The nails at the top, which are going to the upper top plate, are actually resisting the earthquake force provided by that framing anchor, also called a shear transfer tie. So this is not a particularly good idea. And why this happened, I have no idea. Why someone decided to, you know, they just decided to just look prettier or something. I have no idea how this happened. I was actually on the committee and um, I, I must have been asleep or they did it when I wasn't there. I have no idea how this happened. So anyway, but you need to watch out for it. So now we're looking at a construction detail from FEMA DR4193. This was uh, produced after the Napa earthquake in California that caused quite a bit of damage. So here you can see again, we have the nail here in the upper top plate, one in the lower top plate, upper top plate. And later on, there is a marking that says the distance between here and here should be four inches. So here we have the exact same problem. It's, you know, the exact, exact same consequences. And um, anyway, let's go ahead and see what the other guidelines had to say. So here's another guideline that came out this year, 2019. This is FEMA P-1100, which is, you know, another retrofit guideline. Actually cost them quite a bit of money. It's almost 200 pages long. And let's go ahead and see what it has to say. So right here we do have these, these are nails are four inches apart. So based on some testing that they did, uh, you know, for some reason these people can't use common sense. They have to do a test. And so they did a test, and what the test told them was, well, all the earthquake force goes through the shear transfer tie, and the nails are inch and a half long, and it goes into the inch and a half uh, thick uh, two by four. The nails are not three inches long, so no force goes into the lower top plate. But anyway, they did a test, and they said, oh, gee, we did a test, and the earthquake force is going into the upper top plate. So what they did, they did make a very significant change here. We're very happy to see it. And so these nails up here are every four inches apart, exactly like they should be. Now, you'll also see a set of nails right here and um, I have no explanation for that. I actually know both the engineers who put this together. I talked to one of the engineers and I said, you know what, why are those there? And he said, well, sh she didn't really know, um, but she'll have to ask. And that's this weird obsession with like, man, let's put another nail in or 
let's uh, let's make it look pretty or something. I have no idea why they had to put nails in there. They're not paying for these nails, so I guess that's it. I'd like to also point out something to you that's very interesting. You see this little cross thing? This is supposed to be, this is behind the plywood. This is basically framing. So this is a two by four here, and this is a two by four here. And what it says is that this should be new two by four blocking. So that's a block and that's a block with eight penny nails. Those are the size nails we talked to you about. And they're supposed to be four inches on center. That's the nailing. So that's the nailing here and that's the nailing here where the cripple walls are greater than four feet tall. Now, this makes absolutely no sense. There's no testing that showed that's necessary. There's no anything that showed that necessary. Someone literally pulled that out of their back of their head or out of their ear or somewhere. This makes absolutely no sense. I actually sent this to a structural engineer who specializes in seismic retrofitting and I said, you know, is there any rationality behind this? What, you know, what was this person thinking? And he had absolutely no idea. I'm afraid to ask the person. I happen to know who it is. I'm not going to ask them why they put this in here, but they did. Now, some people wonder why it is that Howard has no respect for government guidelines. They have very little respect for the government, period. But as far as the retrofit guidelines go, I have even less respect. And they do things like this. All these guidelines have some crazy thing in there like this that just I lose all respect for these guidelines where which are supposed to be published by the best and the brightest and if they just go crawl around under a house with me a little bit uh, i could you know i could show them the way things actually work so this sketch right here shows you how uh, shear walls fail what happens is the plywood buckles so right here we have the plywood this is the framing the nails uh, through it, there has been no buckling. Everything is you know, nice and strong. The nail held up just like it's supposed to. This one, the force was strong enough to pull the uh, plywood off of the framing and the nail ended up you know, staying there, but it was also pulled up. And right here, it's actually complete failure. The plywood has pulled up and off of the framing. The nail is still there. And this is you know, one where at this point, the uh, plywood really isn't resisting anything. So let's go ahead and see what it actually looks like. So here we have a, you know, this is a OSB that does the exact same thing as plywood. And in this case, it, you know, buckled away from the framing. When it did that, you know, you can see where it pulled away. So this nail used to be in this hole right here. And this one used to be in a hole up here. And this one used to be in a hole up here. So the nails are still there but the uh, plywood or the OSB has pulled away. And that's what you know we try to prevent from happening whenever we build a shear wall. And one of the ways to do that is you just put in as many nails as you can because the more nails you put in, the more secure the, uh, the connection to the framing. And that's one of the reasons, that's, a, that's one of the uh, good reasons to make shear walls that are as strong as you possibly can with as many nails as you possibly can uh, in an attempt to prevent this from happening. Now we're going to take a quick look and see how to frame and build shear walls uh, in step foundations. So here we have a step up and what we've done here is we put a stud, a two by four right here, right on the edge. So I see how these are spaced apart. This is 16 inches, 16 inches. And then we do this one closer because we want to get right on the edge of the step right here. Now we do the same thing on this side. So we go another two by four right on the step right here so that they're touching each other. Then we nail them together, you know, as we, we discussed earlier. And so now we have this piece of plywood right here by the red piece of plywood right here and then of course we do all of our edge nailing everywhere now the reason you want to do this is so that you don't have to make some funky you know cut you know that's uh, otherwise you got to put a jog in the cut this is really simple you just cut one piece right here it's just you know rectangle the one over here is also a rectangle and they're just it's just so much easier to do so you just put the two together and uh, you know nothing nothing fancy I know just from experience whenever I try to do these uh, you know sometimes it'd be like three and a half feet tall and I'm trying to measure it this way and that way and get the elevations and all that stuff and it always come out all screwed up so this is the best way it's you know just a whole lot simpler so uh, if you're building shear walls i recommend you do this uh, if you want to know more just go ahead and put your uh, click your pause button and you can read a, a little bit more about it
So here's an example of what I'm talking about. Here's the step foundation. And in this case, what the contractor did is he made one big piece that's, you know, this L-shaped right here. He cut a jog right in here. And, uh, you know, this is really a major pain in the ass. I mean, I've done this before, you know, trying to just get the jog in there, get it straight, get the height straight. And then this extra, extra thing right here he had to put in uh, for this big beam. Uh, that even made it more difficult. So just to go over it one more time, it'd be so much simpler if you just put in one stud from here up. So there's one stud right here, another stud right here, and then you put a rectangular piece of plywood right here, a rectangular piece of plywood right here, and you could go ahead and cut the jog in there if you want. You know, of course you're going to need to. And that's pretty much it. It's really simple. Now I'd like to point out that you don't need to worry about right here, the two by four is going to touch the concrete. A lot of people get all worked up. Oh my God, the, the, the code says, you know, that um, Douglas fir cannot touch concrete unless we have some kind of barrier or it's pressure treated. That's all a bunch of BS. If you look at the way, um, you know, new construction is done, if you look at the siding, you know, it's plywood siding. It's fairly, it's, you know, it's not as strong as regular wood by any means. And it'll be butted right up against the concrete. So next time you walk going in a near construction site or even looking at a house and you'll see the uh, plywood siding and you can see it by, usually it's got some lines in it, some vertical lines, and it'll be touching the, touching the concrete and it's outside. So here it's not outside. And also I talked to some uh, contractors down in the Los Angeles area and they said that some of their older homes actually have Douglas fir uh, mud sills, which are sitting right on the concrete, and they're not rotting out. So anyway, don't get too excited about it. Uh, go ahead and put a standard 2x4 up here and where it touches the concrete. Uh, you won't have any problems with that. Sometimes it is necessary to join two horizontal seams together in order to transfer the earthquake force down to the foundation. So let me show you how that works. This is one piece of plywood. This is another piece of plywood. And if there's a seam right here, they're disconnected. In other words, earthquake forces are going to be coming into the top plate right here. Then they're going to meet this seam and they're going to have nowhere to go except into these two by fours, which is not you know, really a shear wall. So then we have to connect it to this bottom piece of plywood. And if, in other words, we're trying to make this whole thing act like one piece of plywood. So the way we do that is we put blocking right in between the two by four studs. And then we um, use staples. These are inch and a half staples. So we put a, you know, we staple this piece of plywood that's shown in green. And then we take the, another piece of plywood that's shown in red and we staple the bottom of this piece of plywood. So it would be the bottom of this piece of plywood here is stapled along this edge right here. The top of the green piece of plywood is stapled right here. So it looks like this where the staples are. So you see a lot of staples. And you can put in quite a few staples. It you know, really doesn't matter. Now another way to do this is you use uh, blocking and nails. In this situation, because the blocking can split, I would use a 4x4. Four four. So let me show you what that would look like. Uh, right here rather than putting in flat blocked 2x4s. Remember these are flat blocked meaning this right here this is a wide edge it's three and a half inches so rather than doing that you put in 4x4s and then that way the nails don't split. So anyway that's the way uh, one way that you do horizontal seams. Another way to do this is with sheet metal blocking. This is our preferred method it goes a lot faster so let me show you how that works. Here we have a piece of sheet, a piece of plywood um, up here, a piece of plywood here, and right behind this sheet metal there is a seam uh, between the two pieces of plywood. So all we do is we take some sheet metal and we staple here at the bottom and we staple here at the top and that creates our seam. Now this has been tested by the American Plywood Association. It's a very viable way to do this and uh, this is just one other method. So here's a construction detail that shows you the exact same thing. Right up here we have our piece of plywood. That's you know plywood number one, so that's a piece. Then we have a piece of plywood right here. And then this is where we put the sheet metal splice. 
So the, actually the seam right here between the two pieces of plywood is here. This tells you it's 26 gauge sheet metal, it's five inches wide. That means you're gonna have inch and a half, uh, two and a half inches above this seam total, two and a half inches down here, and then you just put a bunch of staples. In this case, you use five eighths um, inch staples. They're 16 gauge staples, and you just staple the heck out of it. Again, this is approved by the American Plywood Association. We find this to be a little bit faster than using blocks. Uh, you know, the, our, our preference is the flat blocks and the staples. And then our second preference is, the, well, I'm sorry, the sheet metal is our first preference. Then the flat blocks with the staples is our second preferred method. And thirdly, we use the nailed blocking. Now, the nailed blocking is what you'll see in engineer specifications because they don't know about these two methods. But um, our preference is the other two methods. Now, sometimes this can be really handy if you have an excess hole that is smaller than the uh, sizes of plywood you need. So let's take an example. Let's say you have a crawl space opening that is only 24 inches you know, in a square, 24 inches tall, 24 inches wide, and you need to get some plywood under there that's, say, four feet, uh, four feet tall. So in that case, what you would do is you take a piece of plywood and you would cut it in half. So you have 24 inches right here. This, is, this piece is 24 inches. This piece is 24 inches, so that makes your four feet. And then what you do is you just put some blocking right here between the two. And you, if you use the four by four, you nail it, or you can use the staples or the sheet metal, whatever it is you want to do. Uh, and that's how you, you know, deal with the fact that sometimes the excess holes are smaller than the piece of plywood you need to get through them. So another thing we need to worry about with shear walls is keeping them from being damaged from overturning forces. Every shear wall will be subjected to overturning forces. In just some cases, it's worse and need to be protected. In some cases, it's not that big of a deal. Um, so in this case, you can see earthquake force is uh, presented by that red arrow. It comes this way. And then the shear wall is going to want to overturn. Basically, it tries to tip over. And when it does, it can tear the nails out right here. So here's a close-up of what can happen when the shear wall tries to overturn and these overturning forces are not resisted. Here you can see how the plywood has buckled and torn away from the framing and the nails, just like we saw in that picture earlier where the orient oriented strand board had pulled away from the nails and the, you know, and the framing. So this is what we need to prevent, and um, that's done with hold-downs. So this is how hold downs work. We have a, see this gold piece right here? It's on one end. We have the exact same thing on another end. And this, this long, 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 you know, bolt uh, is glued into the concrete with epoxy. So this, this long bolt is attached to this piece of metal called the hold down. And we have the same exact same thing over here. So this is a long bolt. It's glued into the uh, concrete with epoxy. And what happens is, is the earthquake force comes this way and pushes against the house and then the top of the shear wall, it tries to overturn. And when it tries to overturn, that force transfers to the ends into this bolt right here. So it pulls up on the hold down and then it pulls up on the, the bolt that's in the concrete. And when it tries to pull up on the concrete, because the concrete is so heavy, uh, it can't overturn the shear wall. And then these nails right here are, uh, you know, they stay where they should be. Now, this is an important part of every shear wall, and I'm going to have you go to our uh, video on overturning and hold down installation. So if you um, on the upper right, you see the card, it says hold downs, just click on it, and it'll take you to another video where you can learn all about it. So this right here is a complete shear wall. The first thing we want to notice is here we have our edge nailing. So we have our edge nailing here. We have it down here where the hold downs are. We have it down here, and we also have it down here. And also where the plywood, two pieces of plywood meet here at this number six. So we're gonna have edge nailing down this way, and we're gonna have edge nailing this way. So that's our nailing pattern. So over here we have our hold down, and then we have the hold down bolt that's glued into the concrete. This plywood is 15 30 seconds. Now remember 15 30 seconds, it doesn't matter. You know, once you get beyond 15 30 seconds, it doesn't really matter, you know, the thickness of the plywood, whether it's 5 8 or 3 quarter. It really doesn't matter. You do want structural one, though. If you get a rated uh, plywood, which is a different grade, 
uh, the shear walls will not be as strong. So anyway, 15 32nd, which is commonly known as half an inch. But um, anyway, that's the plywood that you want to use. And so uh, I'd like to point out here that these nails are always 12 inches on center. Those are the ones that's called in the field. To put more than that is just useless. Uh, all the tests were done uh, with uh, nails that are 12 inches on center. They're just there to kind of hold the plywood uh, where it's supposed to be. Now these ventilation holes right here and right here and right here, they're really not necessary. Ventilation holes are kind of ridiculous. Um, you see them ever since the appendix chapter A3 was written in the 60s. Uh, that sort of started a precedent. Um, there's no reason you need to ventilate anything in a shear wall. You don't ventilate, ventilate the, the walls in your garage. You don't do the ones in your house. There's no reason you have to ventilate these. However, it is a good idea for future reference to go ahead and put a uh, inspection hole where the bolts are. So right here we have at number three, we have an inspection hole so that if someone is going to buy the house, wants to know what happened here, uh, he can actually look through the hole and see that there's a bolt. And uh, that's pretty much it. I'll just let you study this at your leisure. And, um, and you know, if you have any questions about it, uh, most of them can be answered on the website elsewhere, especially if you go to the section on, you know, the video on hold downs and overturning. That describes a, a big part of the shear wall. When we're building retrofit shear walls, oftentimes we need to cut notches and big holes and work around windows and, you know, heaters and, you know, gas meters and all sorts of stuff uh, in order to make our plywood fit. And when we do that, we put great big holes in them or small holes, slots, and we need to do something to repair that because a shear wall with lots of holes in it are, is not effective. So right now we're going to learn one way to do that. So here is a heating duct that went through our wall and you can see this great big hole right here and we want to make sure that that wall, that hole, uh, is not there anymore so that the integrity of the plywood uh, is maintained. Now the way we do that is we take a piece of plywood and we put, uh, this is this is flooring adhesive, this is structural flooring adhesive here, we, we, you know, we spread it all over the piece of plywood, we cut a hole out right here which is going to go where the uh, heating duct is, and then what we do is we take that piece of plywood and we, you know, glue it to the existing plywood. So here you can see the cut edge of where that piece of plywood is, comes around here and here and then it goes over here and basically repairs that hole where we don't have to worry about the earthquake forces, you know, when they're generated up here, make sure that they can go over here on this section of plywood, go over here on this section of plywood and not sort of be, you know, be lost and not able to go, uh, go anywhere. So we see the exact same thing here. Here we have a slot uh, caused by a pipe. So we had to, you know, the slot right here we had to make uh, in order to make the pipes, you know, to, in order to get the sure plywood to fit. And then we did the exact same thing. We took a, a piece of plywood and we put the, you know, we put a bunch of glue on top of it. We cut a little notch right here and we put it up uh, to repair that. So here is this again. Again, we just put the plywood patch over here just like that. And now we've maintained this particular shear wall as if pretty much it didn't have any, you know, it didn't have any holes at all. So it's going to be 100% effective uh, because we've done this repair. The last thing we're going to look at is diagonal sheathing. Uh, most engineers, contractors don't know that diagonal sheathing is actually a fairly earthquake resistant material. Uh, and we're going to go ahead and explore that right now. Just to show you this is an example of it. Here we have the boards are at a 45 degree angle or so usually find three, maybe four nails in here, three or four nails into the mud sill. And the really great thing about diagonal sheathing, usually the entire wall is covered with, uh, with the diagonal sheathing. We normally see this on uh, some, you know, pretty, it's really hard to predict. Just sometimes we see some houses that have this and uh, it's much more labor intensive, much more expensive for contractors to do it. For some contractors, you know, we're just thinking ahead. Uh, because, you know, it is much better braced wall and it's pretty obvious when you're working on a house, you know, you find out when you do this, it's uh, very stiff and rigid. You almost, you always see this on either side of a garage door opening, especially in San Francisco, because it does brace those walls, uh, which are usually narrow and keeps them from racking. So we're going to go ahead and look at the building code, what it happens to say about this material 
and uh, so that you know uh, you know what to what to think of it when you see it. So as you can see in this row that's highlighted by yellow that represents diagonal sheathing, uh, there's a, it has a fair amount of capacity. This right here on the chart where it says sheathing nominal dimensions, what that means is that rather than being a full one inches thick, it's only three quarters of an inch thick. Or right here where it says two inches thick, it's actually an inch and a half thick. But no matter which ones you use and what configuration, uh, you know, and how, how they're nailed, they're all worth uh, 600 pounds per linear foot. And that's quite a bit. 600 pounds per linear foot is, you know, that's actually stronger than uh, plywood, which is nailed uh, <clears throat> three inches on center, three inches apart, uh, with eight penny nails. However, there is something where we have to reduce it. And there's a section there that says nominal unit shear capacity shall be adjusted in accordance with 4.2.3 to determine ASD allowable unit shear capacity. In other words, that's the same as you would find in the shear wall tables, the same type of uh, rating that you would find in the shear tables. And what that section says is you must divide by two. So when you look at the uh, diagonal sheathing, this number right here, you divide by two, and that is your actual rating for the plywood relative to shear walls. Now, if you have an entire wall, that's you know braced with diagonal sheathing it's in pretty good shape because in a regular retrofit you'll usually do maybe a quarter of the wall maybe um you know probably you know that's that's normal at you know maybe 600 pounds or 500 pounds per linear foot but if you do the if the entire wall already can resist 300 pounds per linear foot i would put that on my low you know part of the bottom of my list in terms of things I need to do on my house. I, you know, I'd look at a kitchen remodel or something before I'd look at that. Now, the one thing I do want to point out, which is fairly important, is right here in the building code for new construction, that single and double diagonal sheet lumber walls shall not be used to resist seismic forces. Now, that's simply because plywood is available. So they're not going to have people, you know, putting in you know, uh, diagonal sheathing when plywood would work. Plus, nobody in their right mind would do it anyway because it'd be so expensive. But anyway, that's for new construction. It's not allowed. But, you know, overall, it really can resist uh, earthquakes pretty well, and that's something that I would consider. So anyway, right now, I've pretty much uh, told you everything about plywood nailing and construction methods that I know. I'm sure there's a few things that I, I don't know. I do recommend you go through uh, APA Research Report 150 54, which if you go to the search box in the website uh, and you just type in uh, 154, it'll take you to a web page that talks all about it. It's got stapled shear walls and high capacity shear walls and double shear walls and all the research that was done uh, by the American Plywood Association in regard to plywood. So anyway, if you have any questions about this uh, and I, you know, look around through the website, uh, you can go ahead and email me and I'll do what I can to help you understand these things. One thing I'd really appreciate is if you would use the comment function of the YouTube video and let me know any questions, any concerns, uh, any comments, anything at all. And the reason I'd like to do that is if you have any questions or observations that you can share that with other people. Uh, these videos are watched quite a bit from people who have a technical um, interest and your comments they probably have as well, or their questions they probably have as well. So this is a very serious public safety issue. I really want to get this information out to as many people as I possibly can. And if you have a question, someone else will have a question. If you have a comment, someone else would probably like to read it and, and maybe focus on that part of the video. So if you can do that, it would be greatly appreciated. And again, it would be in the interest of public safety. Uh, this is a very serious issue and people will lose their homes they will lose their lives and you can help contribute uh, by using the comment section so anyway thank you very much